And so that, to me, is a bigger potential issue than a 507 on an MCAT. Welcome to Ask Dr. Gray Pre-Med Q&A. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Gray. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. What can I help you with today? So I really had a question for you about kind of knowing whenever you're competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, For me especially, I am a non-traditional applicant. Um, So between working a full-time job right now and trying to prepare my application, I'm just feeling a little lost and a little uncertain of knowing, do I have enough? Are my scores good enough? Do I need to take more classes? Yeah. What, what can I do to make myself more likely to get interviews and get an acceptance somewhere? In other words, you are like every other pre-med out there going, <laughs> what are my chances? Absolutely. Yeah. Talk- it, I just feel a little more lost without having uh, a pre-med advisor at a school anymore yeah. to kind of help guide me and lead me on the path. Do you know if the the school that you went to, if they offer their services for alumni? A lot of times they do Uh, that. They do for a certain period of time, but I just passed out of that threshold. Okay. So you're, you're floundering out on your own. Um, That's, that's okay. Where do you think is the biggest potential issue with your application? Well, I feel that my biggest potential issue is in my MCAT score. Um, So I had gone down this route whenever I was in undergrad and I took the MCAT twice, but in both of those times, I wasn't really in the right position and I didn't give it the respect that I needed to. And my scores reflected that. Yeah. But it's been a few years now since I've really considered making this uh, commitment and trying to take this path, but it's still just been gnawing at me in the back of my head of wanting to go to med school, wanting to be a doctor yep. and especially working at a hospital, doing research. It just fuels that even more. So I finally came to that point of, all right, I'm committed and giving in everything and had a great improvement for my score, but I'm still just a little nervous that I didn't quite improve enough. And I'm not yet at that threshold that I need to be. What's your score? Uh, 507. Okay. Good score. Not blow it out of the water. Amazing, but, yes. but, but decent and good. Uh, and just to, for comparison, for those listening and watching right that the average for matriculants, which is what you're probably basing it off of and going, no, it's not good enough. The average for matriculants is like a 511, 512 now. So yes. when, especially for someone like yourself, a non-traditional student who, has two prior poor scores is like, well, 507, that's, that's still short of the average for matriculants. But remember the average is made up of a lot of numbers. And so uh, a 507 for a lot of schools is going to be good enough. Right. I talk about this a lot and I get a lot of flack. They're like, what do you mean good enough? Uh, And and so good enough, meaning it's going to get through the filters, right? Those digital shredders. It's going to, and by it means your application, your application will get through those. Your application will end up on someone's desk. Now, what does the rest of your application say? So 507, again, isn't uh, amazing. Uh, A lot of advisors will tell you to retake it. I don't Mm -hmm. think you need to yet uh let's let's hear the rest of your story (laughs) to see where else things are um so as a non-traditional student when's the last time you've taken classes uh the last time that i took classes was in 2017. okay so it's been a few years how's your gpa uh my math and science gpa was a 3.67 and my total cumulative gpa was 3.71 okay so again solid GPA, not, oh my God, amazing 3.9 something GPA. Uh, Okay. And what about the rest of your experiences? You said you're working right now in research. What about clinical experience, shadowing, et cetera? Yeah. um, I have roughly 500 hours of clinical and shadowing experience. Um, I was a part of a mentorship program at a hospital in Johnstown that's I spent a week I, over each week I spent 
uh, shadowing a different position in a different specialty. Mm -hmm. And in total, I shadowed uh, 12 different specialties. Some of them we had, we did two different specialties in a week. Yep. Uh, but that was really eye-opening because it just gave me the spectrum of, you know, clinical medicine, which yeah. was really good. When was that? Same thing. That was a bit older. That was uh, back in 2016 that I did that. Is that the only shadowing that you have? Um, I have some other, you know, little shadowing here and there, you know, five hours this day, 10 hours here, things yeah. like that. How recent? Uh, same thing. The most recent shadowing that I have is 2017. Okay. Yes, that sounds about right. So shadowing is a little bit old. And is the research that you're doing now, is that clinical research or is it more bench kind of research? Um, a little bit of both. Um, so I, my research, the work that I do is in a bench laboratory, mm -hmm. um, but I work for two dermatologists that we do clinical trial studies. Okay. How, how much interaction with patients are you doing? Um, a little bit. I will go into the clinic and help to collect uh, blood samples and some skin samples from them. Uh, so I, I get a little bit, but I'm not necessarily working with patients every single day. Okay. When's the last time you had any sort of bigger clinical experience? Um, I would say the last sort of big clinical experience I had was in 2017. Okay. So the, the question for me, for you, is you're going to apply to medical school, potentially, mm -hmm. let's say next year, right? You, you took the MCAT again. It sounds like you're, you're gearing up for an application. And you, did you apply this cycle or no? Am I, am I jumping the gun? No. Uh, okay. With the state of everything, <laughs> I decided I can wait another 12 okay. months. Okay. So let's, let's assume May, June, 2021 rolls around and you have the same experiences you have now. You're trying to just like in research, right? Prove this hypothesis of, I want to go to medical school and yet you're really not doing anything to show that you want to go to medical school. You're not getting clinical experience. You're not shadowing. Uh, the research potentially, depending on how much clinical experience you're getting, could be good. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you're downplaying that a little bit for, for clinical. And so the question's going to be, okay, 507, decent score, not not amazing. Let me look at the next thing. Okay, 3.6-ish, 3.7 GPA, okay. Not, oh my God, outstanding, but still pretty solid. Let me go look at the next thing. Oh, he hasn't really gotten any shadowing or clinical experience anytime soon. How can you tell me that you want to be a physician without actually going and doing the things that show me that you want to be a physician? So you're very, very common for non-traditional student, especially, but even for traditional students, you're very typical story of someone who applies without the story that supports what you're saying, right? You're saying, I need to be a physician, right? You even told me earlier, like I had this day, just this gnawing thought of like, I, I need to go back to medical school. I'm working mm -hmm. uh, or need to go to medical school. I'm working in the hospital and it's just in my face and I need to do it. And yet you're not doing it. You're not, you're not, playing the baby doctor of, of shadowing and getting other clinical experience. And so that, to me, is a bigger potential issue than a 507 on an MCAT. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, I totally see what you're saying. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a struggle with, you know, trying to juggle the, the real life 40 hour a week job. And then now, especially with everything going on makes it harder to get in places and have people willing to let me come in and see patients with them. Yeah. Well, the good thing is you already work in the hospital. So you already have those clearances. You obviously already have some sort of COVID protocol training. You, you have some exposure to patients and physicians already. Now the question is how do you get more and can you leverage the the job and relationships that you already have for more do your uh the physicians and other people that you work with do they know that you want to go to medical school 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I would lean on them first to say, hey, um, I, I, I talked to uh, someone about my application and they really think I should be getting some more exposure in these areas. Is that something you can help with, right? Maybe you stay late one day. Maybe you come in early one day. Maybe instead of taking a lunch, you're, you're shadowing. Um, doing those kinds of things to, to leverage the, the network that you already have will definitely help. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So what are next steps for you? Oh, I need to go around the department and talk nicely to all the doctors. To let them <laughs> help me, yeah, let, allow me to come see patients with them in their clinic days and whenever they're in there. And hopefully my bosses can help me coordinate that to still get my work done and keep those hours, um, but then be able to cut out for an hour or so each day to spend some time actually working with patients, yeah. Exactly, right? And there's probably a good chunk of your work that doesn't have to take place between nine to five, right? You, and so the normal patient care side of things typically is around a normal nine to five schedule. So so if you could carve out a little bit time during that nine to five to maybe act as like a pseudo MA, maybe one of the, you, you talk to one of the physicians or you get in with the department and say, hey, I'd love to learn how to bring a patient back and take their vitals and interact with them and ask them why they're here, et cetera. And, and so you get an hour or two of experience, or maybe it's a, a half a day once a week. And then you spread out those, those extra four or five hours over the course of just staying a little bit later, uh, each of the other days. So there, there's lots of flexibility and lots of potential, especially for someone like yourself who's already in a clinic. Now, especially now during the pandemic for students who aren't in a clinic already, who don't already have that uh, access to a hospital, obviously it's much, much harder. And, and unfortunately, a, a lot of places just aren't going to let students in right now and we just have to wait it out. But you're there. So you, you, you got the access. So yeah. I, I think it's easy to make it happen. I, I think if you start now, you're probably fine still applying next year with uh -huh. those increased uh, increased clinical experience hours, some, some more shadowing hours, getting a few hours a week between now and applications I think is plenty on top of obviously everything that you've already done. But it just, it restarts that story and, and it, and truth of, I need to be a physician, here's what I'm doing to show uh, myself that I still want to be a physician and to prove to you that this is what I want. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's something I've kind of been wondering of, are schools going to look at, well, he got a lot of clinical experience, but it's been a couple of years since he's yep. been exposed to it. You know, how does that read to, a review board. Yeah, it's it's very questionable. It's like why why now? What what has changed? Uh, obviously, you didn't pull the trigger then. What's changed now? All I can see is you're doing this research. That doesn't really tell me that you need to be a physician. So mm -hmm. definitely is is something that uh, I'm I'm glad you have you have a little bit of time before the applications to actually work on that. Okay, fantastic. Are there any any other questions? Any other thoughts? Um, I mean, sure, obviously, <laughs> you know, life of a pre med and someone that's gearing up for application, yep. you're always second guessing yourself and always questioning yourself. Yep. Um, I recently started reading the personal statement book, so that's been very helpful in crafting those. Um, I guess in that sense of when to include something in the personal statement versus when to save it for an activities description and when is it okay to overlap and have something show up in both? Almost always, whatever's in your personal statement will be in your activity list. The question is what from your activities goes into your personal statement? And mm -hmm. so remember that the personal statement is all about why do you want to be a physician? And really coming to the conclusion after you do a lot of brainstorming and thinking about your journey in the experiences that you've had and recalling those memories and really asking yourself what two or three or maybe four experiences 
have I had almost always around patient care, not research, not anything else, around patient care that have really exposed me and shown me that this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Those those are the experiences that you pull out of your activity list and put not not pull out, but you use from your activity list to use in your um, in your personal statement. But don't not include them in your activity list. Okay. So I, I know that you've said in some of your other videos that you don't like using clinical and shadowing experience for uh, most meaningful. Um, but with that kind of a thing, it's... Clin- clinical, yes. Okay. Shadowing, no. Because I, okay. I, I say shadowing, I don't like shadowing for most meaningful because shadowing just isn't a meaningful activity, right? Just, okay. just in general, the definition of shadowing is you're there watching. It's it's not a super impactful experience. I understand it's super exciting as a pre-med, right? You're there, <laughs> you're in the clinic, you're following the doctor. Like, I remember those days. It was it was amazing. Yeah. But, but remember that most meaningful is what are the activities that have been the most impactful to you in your life? Not what activities were you most excited about becoming a physician? That's it's a very different question. So that's that's where I say I I I typically don't recommend putting shadowing as a most meaningful experience. Not that makes a little bit more sense now. Yeah. It's always always the context around <laughs> what I'm saying that that helps solidify it. Yes. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? No, I I mean those those are really the things that have been bugging me the most of, yeah. especially with the MCAT of, well, do I really need to take this again? Cause I'd love to not have to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think from, for your standpoint, it's one of those scores that it's, it's a hard decision, right? It's, it's obviously a better score is better. A worse score is worse. Uh, <laughs> where you're at right now is just like, ugh, like, and so my my typical recommendation is, what is your risk tolerance and threshold? Are you okay with putting in an application with everything that you've done now and, and getting some more clinical experience, more shadowing, putting in an application with that 507, showing an improvement over your previous scores, which in of itself is a good little story in there as well. Are you okay with doing that and then not getting into medical school and getting the feedback of your MCAT needs to be higher, which unfortunately is a very kind of default answer, even when it's not the MCAT that is the biggest issue. Mm-hmm. Schools just point that out as like, oh yeah, the MCAT could be higher, right? Work on your MCAT. If you're okay with going through that process, spending the money for the application and getting a rejection on the basis of it's your MCAT score, are you going to be okay with then going, retaking the MCAT and reapplying? Or would you rather play it a little a little safer and, and right now as we're recording this at the beginning of September go, okay, I know that I can take the MCAT at the beginning of the year before I apply. I'm just going to start studying again for it now. I want to put together the best application possible the first time even with a decent score, I need to improve my chances. And it really depends on you and your personality and what your risk tolerance is to to applying and getting rejected and to the whole timeline of being delayed a little bit more. Well, that certainly gives me a lot to think about and consider Good. as I uh, try to move forward in these next few months and hopefully be ready for applying in the next cycle. Well, good. Good luck to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gray. I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a great day.